What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Atlas. Today, we are going to be featuring Corey Shake. What's up, brother? <laughs> What's up? I love how you say it. <laughs> it's nice. I'm so used to chic in the, you know, in white people Canadian town, but yeah, it's nice. Yep. Got to get that Middle Eastern root shake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, bro. Mm -hmm. Super excited for this. I'm also really grateful for Nargis for introducing us, making it happen. Although we were aware of each other, um, she really like bumped it uh, to make it happen, which was great. Put us in a thread. Um, got us yeah. about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the the web's connecting really strongly now. More than ever before this past year, I've noticed, you know, like people who've been kind of in the scene for a while now, it's like the webs are just like really coming together. It reminds me of that like idea of, you know, you're only like one person apart or two people apart or something like that. I don't know. The, I don't know the quote, but like yeah, everybody's you're seven, connected. You're seven links away from anyone on the planet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And I, I'm seeing that so much now. You know? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this also Rack Razam, who is also on our show um, about six months ago or so for maybe the th third or fourth episode together. I love his vibe. He called it the Samadhi Mesh Network coming online. Um, <laughs> and I just I love that. Or he's also called it um, a Galactivation. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I love all of the ways to describe it. Um, and it can even be simplified to like, if you like NFTs and you want to find other people that like NFTs, it's so easy for you to just join like Discord uh, channels and watch YouTube videos and find people on Twitter. Um, but all the way to awakening and waking up and the people that are waking up finding each other. Um, another good one from Rex energy is uh find the others there are no others <laughs> mm, nice should be on a t on a t-shirt you know that's a t-shirt <clears throat> yeah for sure so cute oh, well. so yeah. we, bro what is up with everything um behind you you are um <laughs> yeah give us give us the scoop on on um all that's behind you and then we have several other um cool threads to pull on together that i'm feeling yeah. Um, well, I, I just started doing more videos like in this corner. I used to do it in my other corner. And it's so funny because I was really contemplating this today, like in um, just as I was reflecting on this interview or this talk that we're going to have and we are having. And um, it was like the the paradox of like the ultimate simplicity, you know, particular teachings that we come to that are like timeless you know, the, like the golden rule, let's say, or, you know, some Lao Tzu quote or something like this. And it just kind of like, or a Zen cone, it just kind of like stops the mind. And, you know, it, it's, 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 or even just on Instagram, like be yourself, you know, like it's such an entry level idea, but it's actually like the Supreme, you know? And so I have this other poster over there. That's like, live your dream, create your happiness, like a typical, like, you know, get at Walmart or something, you know, like <laughs> all the like real basic level quotes on this cute little thing. So I usually did there and then I was reflecting on the idea of just like the ultimate simplicity and then like on the other end, maybe like the ultimate complexity, which is a lot of what this work is, which comes from um, the uh, Kalonic Science Freedom Teaching work, which is some of the original or more expanded Law of One teachings. And, um, you know, I know you guys are into the Law of One um, uh, channelings and things and, you know, they give a, a lot of really beautiful components to you know, I guess we could say that maybe the teachings of all time or, you know, the teachings of the cosmos. And then when you get into Kalontics and freedom teachings, this is like, you know, it's kind of like law of one on steroids in my view. Like it's like all the mechanics, it's all the advanced light body, you know, uh, systems and um, the the real deep like quantum science behind ascension and behind incension and behind um, our bioregenesis, which is our, our healing process, you know. So it's just funny because, yeah, like I'm you, you, like, you know, you go through the path of non-duality or yana and it brings you to such a supreme simplicity that it, you, you essentially become that simplicity. 
But the funny thing and the paradox is you become that simplicity, but that's that's actually the doorway to then live this like like you know just wild the, the wildest complexity you could ever you know you can't even conceive right and that's a lot of what a lot of this is and you know post realization at least from what people typically say you know about a yana awakening or something like this i i that's when i really got into more of the more complexity and advanced elements while still rested in a lot of that you know these kind of like simple pieces because to me that's really what life is it can be really simple you know um, and it's best that way I find because you're, you know, so overwhelmed versus previous times in my life when I got into a lot of this, you know, it was just so overwhelming. It was like reading the most advanced, like quantum physics textbook that I had no, like, I'm like, I can't do this, you know? Um, so, you know, so it's been many years that I've been involved in this and it's, it's basically just like in, in the simplest way to put it, it's basically looking at like a very high level or advanced level of Buddhist teachings, like light body Buddhist teachings. Um, we could say like, Tibetan Dojin or Vajrayana, you know, getting into all the different forms of light bodies, because there's many different forms. And um, really just the eternal, you know, because much of my path, especially in the Yana, the Yana path, and, you know, coming into a realization, this, my questions were often like, well, what's after enlightenment, like, it's, it's I'm not gonna just like, end, like, live in a blob of nothing, you know what I mean? Like, what's, like, what's after it, that's constantly what was coming. And so I found like, realization was really just the doorway to eternity it was like the opening to the eternal and now getting into all this kind of stuff it's uh, yeah it's just uh it's humbling i feel like that's probably the best term to uh, describe it yeah mm -hmm. i like how you share on both of those sides of the spectrum where you can have a mainstream simplicity like the Delphic maxim of uh, know thyself um, or even the other ones like uh, like surety brings ruin or nothing in excess, which are like very common um, Delphic maxims, um, maybe even the most prominent or salient ones, the ones that were written at the top of the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. And mm -hmm. those like really resonate with mainstream um, and you could spend a lot of time like inquiring into those, but at the same time, you can really relate to the simplicity of them or even, yeah, the direct path pointings of Lao Tzu or of Buddha um, or of some of the Sufi metaphysic. Um, there's so many like direct ones. I and my father are one also in the Abrahamics. Um, and, mm -hmm. and that those can like really like hit and be like quite like simple but then you have the mathematics behind you that also of course quantum mechanically represents such complexity and we really feel that in this like emergence theory of how uh sentience sort of arises in this universal creation and then sort of like wakes up to itself and then um and then does the dance and explores infinite potential. But at the same time, when we look at it, we can say, actually, it's so simple. Like the, the complexity behind you also boils down to simplicity. And there's like, that's the simultaneity of having something that is both simple and complex at the same time. And you can sort of play with it um, in any of those expressions across, across that spectrum. So I like that share. And then I feel like asking you also, this has been, become one of my favorite questions to tune into on the show, is when we talk about waking up or awakening or abiding awakening, so when it's a mm -hmm. moment to moment direct experience, what do you say that is? Mm. What was coming to me today when I was just like sitting with myself, it was like just being with everything, you know, or first it was being with everything. Then it was being everything <laughs> more directly, you know, because if everything is it already, then it's never not been it. Because if, if, if it's always been it or if it is it, then it's never not been it. It always will be it. You know, when we're speaking of like the absolute nature, God source, which is often the term I use, um, the true reality 
natural reality. Um, if everything's it already, everything's uh, not even a manifestation of it, it's just everything is it directly as it, <laughs> then we can only, we, we only could have ever been that. And of course, it's just the ideas that we've held, the conditioning, the traumas, you know, the, the many distortions to our DNA over the multi-billion year, you know, angelic human history, because it was very long. Um, you know, the working through all that, we could say is the, the quote unquote path. You know, a lot of non-dualists will say, well, there's no path, you know, of course, right? There's, there's, no, there's no path, there's no practice, whatever. But in truth, they, they're, both, they're both real. They're both... Um, like when we look at the teachings, like say the golden rule, the golden rule to me, like treating others as you desire to be treated, that is the most entry level spiritual teaching of them all in my view, right? And it's also the most supreme, like it's the highest teaching and it's the most, it's like non-duality in the perfect form. <laughs> so that teaching and you know, uh, an amalgamation of others, I find are... May, may we just briefly, briefly, because um, this is this is getting fantastic. I, I would just like to briefly check in on the golden rule itself, because um, treating others the way you would like to be treated, I've also heard it um, sort of shifted um, into something more like uh, just treating um, all with love to or you know that type of right um because if one wants to be treated in a you know and then you're treating people in the way that you want to be treated but that's of a like you you actually don't mind it when people are mad or upset or physically sure, sure. you know that type of thing um so how do you feel about that rephrasing and then continue onward with what with what you were saying yeah, why well, there was so many combinations. It's like you see that golden rule like dial with all the religions and then it's like it was shared in different ways through all of them. And there's one there's different ones that resonate more, but I do like that because I feel like it is just a representation of divine love, you know, and true compassion, God's compassion. And I feel like the only way, but th that's the funny part, right? Is the only way that you can come to know that compassion is if you've come to realize the true nature where there is no other, you know, there is no separate self. Mm -hmm. you know because then you see well yeah of course it's only this love you know mm -hmm. and so so coming back to the idea of being everything um i feel it's this it's that simultaneity of both being everything and being nothing at the same time like a typical yeah. like neti neti you know neti neti not this not that and then also i am this i am that you know yeah. the divine love one side and so to me like if we're gonna put it the simplest way i feel like it's both of those happening simultaneously all the time like that's beautiful yeah beautiful brother yes yeah keep going i'm loving it and then yeah. i'll hit a ball back but that's so good. no that's i mean because there's so many ways to describe it and um and i mean I, i've described it in different ways you know i've written about the absolute source you know it's not this it's not that but yet it's everything you know it's it's not god it's not compassion it's not universe it's not all these things it can't even be named there's nothing you can really say to it but yet it's still known and it can be known through the simplest of moments and the most complex of, you know, grand experiences. But in truth, it's, it's this simultaneous knowing that, yeah, there's a complete emptiness, a complete absolute empty that cannot be conceived by any, any mind, no word can touch it. And yet that is also simultaneously so full, you know, with like the, the depth of love and compassion. And, you know, often we found that, in the previous traditions where some being would, you know, realize there would be like an integration process. And after that integration would often be communicated as a dropping in the heart or a dropping into compassion. Right. And if that didn't occur, if that complete awakening didn't occur, that's often why you found gurus finding themselves in sticky situations because the compassion wasn't being what, what the, the movement into the body, the movement into the integration of all the chakras of all the aspects of self, so that that gentle, simple compassion, golden rule or divine love is then realized and manifested, you know, within the walking reality in the simplest of moments. Right. Um, and so so that's been much of, you know, what's what it's been for me, you know, over the past few years is just being humbled again and again and again to this this compassion, this love. And maybe, you know, it's different for a female body, too. I don't know. But. I know for as a male body that it was kind of a different, it was like this, 
you know, empty nothingness, you know, these like the kind of, I wouldn't say hierarchical, but it was, a, it was a bit of a different ride before compared to now where it's like, yeah, again, just endless humility, endless compassion, endless gentleness, like moving deeper into that purity and that innocence. You know? So, so yeah, so that's my best way of describing it. And I feel like maybe in a couple of years it'd be different, but I feel like, you know, keep it as simple as possible. <laughs> Yeah. And I love the coin analogy, uh, one side being nothing and the other side being everything. And then the, you could even say the superposition or the entanglement of those two and also being something at the same time, um, mm. where there is the appearance of the Corey and the Atlas expressions having a conversation, but underneath it is truth source. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Because, you know, often, I guess, in non-dual tradition, there's a lot of speaking to the idea of like, oh, there's nobody here, there's no doer, there's no thinker. And yet, but if we get more direct, more more specific, if everything is the absolute reality, then there is also a doer and a thinker. There, it can be both, right? Like, it's just that the integration of a higher identity is more accurate in my experience, right? Where I, I have felt progressively post realization that there has been a higher identity that has now you could say almost come into the body you know like it's like that's what speaks that's what acts that's what moves that everything is that and sure we could say yes that is the god self um but there's still this individualized expression so i always laugh when people get a bit too attached to that teaching because it's true but then the opposite is also true if everything's absolutely it then it's both you know so yeah this is funny <laughs> hmm. and actually when we approach it from a simultaneity i feel like it's most direct path so even for mainstream to be able to as an entry point recognize how like two sides of the same coin of like the political left and the political right in like the United States or in several of the developed countries um, where there's a conservative and a liberal, that those are so entangled or intertwined or simultaneous. They're dependent. They're codependently arising on each other. Um, mm. It can be a good entry point for also consciousness and physicalism as another one for the simultaneity of that, that there is the appearance of the phone, but the phone itself is dependent on perception, is dependent mm. on consciousness or awareness on that arising. Just like when you take the screen itself and the screen is just like consciousness, just like awareness. And then there is this apparent modulation of it where you go, oh, there's an arising of Neo and then boop, a passing of that thought or sensation, or experience, whatever. And it doesn't have to tie to a sense of self-image. Mm -hmm. That's what gets deconditioned or deconstructed, where every single sensation or experience gets tied to a self-image. And then there's always this seeking energy that wants to extract peace and happiness from the external um, and there's a total deconditioning of that. And then the nature is seen as inherent peace and happiness, um, as inherent empty fullness also. Um, mm. And then it's a lived experience. I think this point is so, so, so overlooked and so important. Um, but it's like Frank Yang, again, one of my close friends, as well as one of arguably one of the greatest uh, inquirers into the nature and communicators of it um, talks about it like a contemplative fitness AI that's constantly running in the background and that mm. there's nothing left but the continuous recognition. Um, and then it, life becomes saturated. You also called it divine love. This divine love is present. Um, and it's felt in every breath. It's felt in every sip of water, bite of food, um, every eye contact. Um, and, and then that's emanated like the sun and that's enlightenment, the emanation, um, of that. And then it, it, it creates 
catalysts. Like the one creates catalysts on itself when it emanates like that. And so um, you, that's, that's still fullness, um, that's still flame, that's still light, um, can generate a lot of um, powerful ripples and um, more so really than, than, uh, than anything else. Mm. Yet it's so important to not become boring. Um, it's, I've noticed that that's, that's the case so deeply, um, <clears throat> that there's like a, a pacification of the spiritual, uh, athlete or warrior or, um, Olympic of consciousness that there's just a, there's like a forgetting of the empowerment side or a forgetting of the paintbrush, basically like, mm. like, bro, like go all out go all out express yourself fully as the one um and like do cool shit be fucking interesting be gangster mm. as fuck um at the same time that you know that none of this is real and yet it's also appearing as it is um and so you can do both at the same time and so never ever lose that also the simultaneity of those two things like one eye all the way back nirvana and the other eye constantly creating constantly mm. paint brushing um and and out of a selfless place out of a pure mm -hmm. place um and that's the divine creatorhood because that's what well, that's what gave rise to the entire creation is that <laughs> frequency and so like to toss that is like just boringness yeah yeah well the piece you said about like the the way i've defined it is kind of like yeah the the no self idea is kind of, is more so the idea that like yeah, there's nothing there to take ownership over everything and another way that i've experienced it or it's happened is um uh like the brakes are off that's kind of a, a good way of describing you know there's there's no you know there's no brakes anymore and that's been yeah the past four or five years like no brakes no brakes so it, 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 it's that's that's the integration you know it's like it's all the traumas all the all the inter inner workings of the being are kind of like reformulating and because there's no breaks it's inevitable that you start to balance that um for me it's been kind of like very much the monk path and then on the other side you know the yeah entrepreneur and out there and creative and doing all the stuff right and so like the the apparent dichotomy or, or difference between the two continues to just it should be shown that that is also, of course, not separate. And it's taken time for me. You know, it's, I feel it's an integration process and maybe very different for everybody. Um, but I know like for my journey, because I've been more um, on the, you know, celibate monk, fasting, minimalism, you know, that type of like lifestyle uh, for so long that the integration into the creative component was, was sparking the whole time, you know, past like 10, 12, 14 years. Um, but again, when those breaks are off, then it's like inevitable that you, you just, you can't not, you, you cannot move in that creative way. Um, and it, a good example of that was, uh, doing that dry fast last week. I couldn't stay still. Like if I stayed still for too long, like my, 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 everything would cramp. I would get kind of grumpy. Like my whole body was just not feeling it, you know? And so even though I have, you know, I'm not eating or drinking for whatever, 10 days, whatever, it's like. I still have to move. I'm still going on like five, 10 kilometer walks. I'm still creating. I'm still doing, because it, it just, can, it was like the most beautiful reminder that in the natural state, which is always there, but in the dry fast, it's just like a more of a kick in the ass. Um, you, you can't stop moving. Like the, the universe is constant change, constant, constant movement, you know? So if you get into that space where it's like, yeah, like the, you know, typical stuff you're talking about, like whatever the nothingness or, you know, attachment to nothingness or something. Um, it's just not possible. Like you just, it just won't, it won't happen, <laughs> you know, for that long at least. So, so I definitely feel you on that for sure. And I think that's, what's, that's, I, I, I appreciate that a lot about the female, a lot of the female teachers around, um, um, a lot more because a lot of them maybe haven't had a meditative path or they haven't explored that that other side of things as much not always but it's common you know especially in RG maybe um 
And it's just, it's fascinating to me because I, I feel that within myself, but it wasn't necessarily my, my path, but post integration, it's so certainly been that. And it's just, it's, yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. Hmm. Yeah. I love that. I love how you share the two sides of the coin in this example, where you have the, the clear uh, cessation of linking sensation, sensation and experience to a sense of self, uh, self-image. Um, and then there's the other side of the coin, which I love how you described, which is the, the foot is fully on the gas pedal. Vroom, creatorhood. Um, and um, I love that. And it resonates so, so deeply. Um, and I feel like the matrix or the mainstream, um, which we could just simply define as just um, people that are in the patterns of governments and economies and the mass media and the money supply and um, uh, not inquiring into the only question that matters, which is what is I? <clears throat> and one of the first big shifts out of that is what you could say is the embodiment of more of the divine creatorhood. Mm. So like when, when somebody gets the urge to like be empowered and go on a hero's journey or pursue entrepreneurship, that type of stuff. And so they do usually put their foot on the gas pretty fucking hard and like go at that. And then there's usually like a question about like, well, what's happiness though? Or like, what is peace? Um, and then there's the inquiry process that usually comes up, which is the, what is I, um, which can be very logical. It can also be very meditative in its experiences of, um, Samadhi and that very deep absorption into unity, um, in the disattachment of, uh, of attaching sensation and experience to, to self, um, mm -hmm. And so I love that. I love that because then that's where more and more of the emptiness, the nothingness, the shunyata, um, the no selfness, um, that's where more and more of that can blossom, which is in many cases, a have found to be um, a later stage of awakening. Um, I've noticed not only with Frank, but with several others in um, in sort of stages or steps of awakening, there's the simultaneity of, of this already being it with itself and that being impossible to have any levels or, or uh, stages because it is already with itself in a conversation here. And that is mm -hmm. what we're talking about, source with itself, just playing with itself here in a universe as these mm -hmm. conscious agents talking to itself. Like there's just no, there's no, it's just front and back of hand. And then um, yet simultaneously, there is the apparent levels or, or stages where as we experience, we can only talk about this retroactively, which is also so interesting. Um, like we, without a doubt, couldn't talk about this 10 years ago, no chance. Um, Cause we were still baked into separation um, and we we're still baked into selfhood, selfing. Um, and I've, I found that a lot of the stage, and I'm really curious if this is similar for you, but I found that a lot of the, um, I found a lot of spirituality um, does seem to end at awareness or consciousness, um, which I do feel is in many ways, um, super helpful like those pointings of course because i feel like it it um goes to um the first stage which is shifting out of ego to uh to consciousness to awareness and being like what the fuck um like is this really 
consciousness talking to itself. And then there's like the transpersonalization or the impersonalization, the universalization um, into like an infinite consciousness, which then appears as like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to transcend the duality even between um, consciousness and object. Um, and then that's the merging of consciousness and physicalism to capital S self or God, everything being that um, very oceanic. Um, and then, then this is sort of where I feel like many people for sure, like that one is already higher level. Um, but that I would say this next one is the investigation into no self. Basically it's the investigation into the nature of sensation and experience and attaching that into self image. And it's more like a, it's more like an Olympic athletes approach to it. It's, it's like someone that's basically turned on the nature of sensation and experience and it's how it automatically creates a sense of self and how you can obliterate or dissolve that by inquiry. Um, and then that's sort of what I found to be what creates the natural, uh, natural state, um, which feels a lot more, um, spontaneous, free, um, and very clearly like awake to all those levels and yet transcending them at the same time. And that's been triangulated now for almost a year now um, by several people that I've been talking to that are some of the most awake people that I know, as well as now myself more and more via direct experience. And so how do you feel about the stages? Um, how do you feel about the levels? And it's obviously, it's clear that we both feel the simultaneity of um, there being none and yet also the appearance of there being some. So how do you feel about that as some sort of like a staged or a, um, a systematized way for us to um, recognize how the one wakes up to itself? Mm. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I mean, I do uh, resonate with the, the gist of that, that um that expression, and I've heard it often, you know, from a lot of these other teachers too. My previous teacher, Ramaji, who I received a transmission from, had a similar uh, kind of concept of moving through um, no self. Well, it was a bit different. It was more initially no self, then it was God self, then it was kind of back to no self a little bit again, almost. And then there's this absolute kind of simultaneity that emerges. And that's um, pretty accurate to how I um, kind of journaled and you know, reflected on my own process um, through that system. And then kind of like what I alluded to before, because, you know, when I, when I, when I tune to the nature of just, well, it's not tune, it's just like, it's always here. Um, and there's a, there's always this here-ness of this simultaneity and it's so simple. It's so easy. It's, uh, it's like unmovable, you know, there's a clear unmovable nature that previous in my experience, I was not, uh, aware of at least we could say you know um so there's that unmovable mountain like knowing that is there and and yet at the same time uh especially coming into the kalonic work um where they're presenting you know this eternal life perspective you know this eternal essentially this eternal ascension where what we've come to know as enlightenment on this path in my view is is kind of like the beginning of eternity you know it's like it's like this doorway into it's, it's almost like we were so we we're so like baby like and childlike that we thought we thought enlightenment was like this big thing and then we come to realize enlightenment and then we realize oh wait a minute like now it's just like here we go you know and that's that's more and more where the humbling for me has been because coming into to, to these studies um although i would you know i was coming from this place of this clear knowing that it, like like frank says like yeah, there's, it's like, if there's no more you can go, like you, you, there's what distance, you know, like, where, where are you to head? What more are you to realize from this knowing? And yet, even while that is accurate, there's still this clarity that, um, well, now, yeah, we're exploring the, the, the eternal space of creation, which certainly does have many more levels, many, many more levels um, in regards to dimensional uh, frequency accretion in regards to uh, frequency flows like for instance what people typically term as kundalini would on a 15 dimensional scale would go from dimensions one to nine 
then we have Maharada frequency, which is the Christ frequency, which is from 10 to 12. Then we have Kirashe, right? 13 to 15. Then you have Kunda Ray, which is beyond that. So these frequencies um, are each different, you know? So even though I, you know, I went through the whole Kundalini thing, and then you have this awakening, and then there's this abidance, um, there's still all these flavors that I, I came to know. And it's very accurate and depicted in um, Buddhist culture where uh, Buddha was saying one thing about light bodies and then other, other masters were saying another thing about rainbow body and other light bodies, golden lotus, but like there was all these different flavors to how the exploration could still evolve. Um, and, and so, so, so that's where I, I come at it from where, yeah, like, and I, I kind of view it like, um, after there was kind of an abidance, it was almost like a honeymoon. I felt like I didn't care about practices. I didn't care about anything. I didn't do anything. I, for months I would, I was going back to the clubs. I was going out and eat all this stuff. I hadn't eaten in a while. I was watching movies for the first time, you know, cause I, I was such like a monk for so long, yeah. um, you know, or so devoted to my, my business. So it was just like monk life business and just like, you know, so I had this like honeymoon, but then after that honeymoon, it was kind of like, oh yeah, like now it's it's this eternal space to explore, right? And like even this diagram here, this is a breakdown of the 12 dimensional time matrix, right? So we have um, earth, which is right here, right? A higher version of earth is called Tara, dimension five. Aya is actually dimension eight, right? Lyra, dimension 12, right? So for instance, if we were to look at that from the standpoint of, okay, we, we, we have attained this realization here on this dimension, but there is a reason why our bodies are not in these different other ranges, right? Simultaneously, we could say, well, there is a reason why that's, that's the case. And I feel like that's the further unfoldment and evolution that actually just naturally happens, almost you could say spontaneously even, right? Like, like to me, of course, not everyone needs to get into all this stuff. To me, it's just fascinating. People could have these activations and, and awareness um, just on their own, you know, just naturally, like you people who just wake up, and then all of a sudden, they're waking up to themselves in some other dimension. I feel like it's just it can be just the spontaneous thing. But, um, but yeah, I'm, 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 I'm quite clear in this kind of, I just love the simultaneity of that, because I feel like it actually is, is, um, it's the true, to me, it's, it's, it's the, it's been the, the humility, right? It's like, yeah, sure. I, I feel like there's this clarity of, of uh, abidance, and, you know, and, uh a non-dual awakening and all these kind of terms and yet at the same time it's like this it's it's like this uh it, i don't know how to describe it the humility it's like you can't even put words to it you know of how how um eternal everything is in every direction you know like even some you know spiritual yana folks i'll start talking about like billion year angelic human human history right because kalonic science in particular they have the ascension mechanics on one side and then the other side they have the like the most mind-blowing history of the universe you could probably find on planet right now and you know a lot of the yana people are not not interested you know <laughs> they don't want to hear some of that stuff right and it's fine I, I, it's just funny to me but but my perspective is like well if you if you are saying that everything's eternal and you're you realize the infinite then it means infinite in every direction Everything is infinite. Every every angle is infinite. The histories, the conspiracies, the the entrepreneurial path, you know, everything in every direction. So if you still have these ideas like, well, Yana is this, you know, Nirvana is this, but then there's still kind of, no, I'm not, uh, that's not it, you know, but like uncom uncompromising non-duality, which I love. But to me, it's like, well, it's to, it's eternal in every direction. So like, let's, let's play with it all, you know? So it's just... um. Yeah, I just laugh. I, it's just, this has been funny to me to observe and and in myself because I I I I, I was very much like this, you know. I didn't uh, wasn't open to a lot of things at times, and even even after abidance, you know, there was still like, you know, or whatever. But I think it's an endless humbling. I think that's what true. That's what awakening is. You just get humbled so 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 many times. You can't you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Happy January eleventh, one eleven <laughs> at eleven eleven p.m. Oh wow, that was amazing. Yeah, it's a beautiful beginning of our brotherhood. 
Yeah, really man. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, it feels really good. And I would love to also um, play on um, Ascension mechanics. That was cool. Um, I also would like to play a little bit more um, together on on fasting um, as we've mm. both um, we're both very interested in that. Um, you're like a, an Olympic uh, athlete though in it, which is very cool. Um, so let's, um, let's play on Ascension mechanics for now. Um, so there's obviously a way that this dance, um, unfolds with itself and it appears to be like, sentience or consciousness uh, waking up to its unity after falling asleep to separation. Mm. Um, and I would love to hear more about how you um, understand the ascension mechanics, because uh, to me, it feels uh, very much like a the one waking up to itself and through the illusion of separation through the uh, you could say the veilless veil or gateless gate which um as we talked about which is that we are always already source and yet we've also apparently forgotten ourselves as that and then remembered um so when you say ascension mechanics do you mean that or what are you talking about specifically pretty much i mean the like as a as a brief history the 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 essence of the kalonic science freedom teachings transmissions were basically a group of teachings that would be translated at particular times in our history um within generally a, an ascension cycle uh, or um you know a starfire cycle so this this cycle stellar activation cycle that we're in right now is from 2000 to 2017 and so what tends to happen is there will be particular speakers. They're individuals who get the contracts to come and scribe in these teachings. So they're basically teachings that are held on uh, holographic discs called the cloister dorator plates. And these are like the teachings of all times. Every tradition on the planet basically has come from these teachings. And when you get into them, you see the crossovers everywhere. It's like everywhere. so, mind -blowing. so uh, mind blowing. Yes. So mind blowing. Those <laughs> crossovers between the traditions. Insane. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. That's it. So. So, yeah. So um, the, the original path of Ascension was generally where we would go through stargates. There's 12 on the planet. They're in different places in the, on the on the planet. And usually the path of Ascension is you'd go through those stargates and you would go up into some of these higher worlds. But because of the histories and the very dark history, actually, of this planet, that plan was changed. And we basically we're basically more in in this path of incension, which is actually, I feel like a lot of people tune in naturally, like this idea that we're moving almost like inward within ourselves and the whole universe is within ourselves. And we can essentially create our own Stargate to go wherever we'd like to go or go home, you know, because we may have a home outside of this time matrix, outside of this universe in a different star or some other place. Um, but we're basically re re-accessing and remembering the divine blueprint or the template, which is another term for uh, we could say the anatomy of God, because we could say like when we get into mathematics or, or like geometries, sound frequencies, we can see that everything has a divine blueprint and structure. And that's why we naturally want to love then kill. That's why we naturally want to like, you know, like all the things we just like things grow, you know, we walk forwards rather than backwards. Like there's this natural blueprint and structure that like, again, when the self that no self is there, then we just follow that natural blueprint most of the time, you know, it just kind of all naturally happens very, very beautifully. So the remembrance of the divine blueprint is essentially the reintegration of our expanded, in this case, 15 dimensional self, I mean, it's really eternal, but if we just start there, um, into this present moment awareness, right? So the, the typical yana teaching of the awakening to God self, I mean, generally when someone's there, like the amount of epiphanies and insights and visions and all the things that are happening every day, it's like you're living years within a day, you know, because you're perpetually remembering everything all the time. Like, you know, all, a lot of the, the blocks are, are kind of um, dissolving. And so that's, that's very accurately actually how I've experienced this because even though for me, like 
I don't always understand a lot of the deep quantum physics stuff or all the sciencey stuff, or I, I have no interest. Maybe you know, it's not. I don't. It's, it doesn't feel like it's so relevant at a particular time. But sometimes even just seeing these codes, you know, or recognizing like this code is a part of our anatomy. You know, like this is actually me, just like this, the spirit body. You know, this is the light yeah. body mechanic, right? So when you look at some of these codes, you're actually seeing yourself again, and it and it and it and it sparks that. So initially, it may just be like a code you're looking at at the wall. But then over time, all of a sudden, it just activates and you literally feel it like you literally feel this this structure, this this living, organic, breathing structure. That's the most like beautiful, like, you know, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. Like, it's just it, every it's everything you could imagine about, you know, you know, you go on these psychedelic trips and you have all these images. And so imagine now, like, you know, you're, you're sober and you're here and you're connected to self. And now you you've actually can feel this living structure that's that's the integration of of what these mechanics have have uh, been for me because it's just been a, a further remembrance you know and and then when we're you know often in all traditions there will be three main important elements right there'll be generally the geometries the mathematics the sound frequencies and the energy intention right like the commandments the virtues you know like acting with right action you know like these kind of core components to our, our conduct and all three in combination have been for me the, the remembrance of my own divine blueprint like when I if I'm chanting particular tones I'm I'm you know because if we look at it from a post-realization perspective pre, pre-realization everything is for seeking you know like I'm going to do this mantra and I'm going to get there I'm going to get there you know but if we look at it from from more practical like okay if I chant this tone it's going to activate this particular thing, right? Like, just like if I want to sign a piece of paper, I use a pencil or a pen, you know, like and I sign the paper. So it becomes just very like what it is, like very practical, not, oh, I, you know, I'm doing this mantra and I got to get some, you know, that's the core um, shift that I felt, you know, because I love still chanting and working with a lot of these style, you know, of, of son or geometries because it activates certain currents of frequency that helps me further remember myself, you know, and, 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 you know, Frank's talked about this too. A lot of people have, you know, you start activating various cities or start having recall of past lives, or you're able to see auras or all these things kind of happen, not because they need to, but because that's just you remembering and seeing, starting to see through the fog and like particularly past lives, you know, it's taken me a long time, but now starting to actually see them and you know, go and remember myself, like, you know, sitting in meditation in an ashram or something like, and actually viscerally like experiencing it. I'm like, man, that's like fun stuff, right? Like what else is there to do? You know, like, that's, that's, that's how I look at it. Right. Um, so, so yeah. And, and this one, you can't really see, like, I really like this one because this is the called the virtues, the 12 virtues and um, you know, basic stuff, love, compassion, you know, integrity, communication, you know, these basic principles, but this diagram, is actually the structure it is actually held as a structure within our anatomy you can't really see it but it's literally like the actual structure of our anatomy so it, you it want brings to pull almost, it off the wall and show it to us yeah that'd be cool this is called the um the uh, wheel of the virtues or the the mandalic mandalic field right it's uh it's also called it's also from the uh, shield of kale so this comes from a certain council of, of of beings called the Mashayana. And the Mashayana is also a similar term to uh, Messiah, which, which is the term for Messiah, but Messiah was a different spelling. And Mashayana is a bit of a different spelling, obviously. Um, but they're the elemental, they're the elemental kingdom, the elemental benders, earth crystal, which is together, air, fire, water, uh, ether. And so this um, mandalic shield, and, and it, the funny thing, you know, like obviously in Buddhism, you have mandalas, this is spelled, um, M-A-N-D-H-A-L-I-C. So it's very similar, but, you know, again, the crossovers. Um, but that, that's that been such a powerful tool for me because post-realization, I was really focused and I was endlessly being humbled to do just like the basic qualities of my human experience, you know, like acting with more integrity, more respect, more compassion, you know, um, I don't know, being on time for things, like communicate, like just all the stuff, like basic stuff of human life that was naturally like revealing. And then when, when, you know, I came into stuff like this, or I was going back into old Buddhist stuff after, um, I was recognizing as, you know, these aspects of like my actual anatomy, 
like just like my finger is a part of my anatomy, the quotient of energy that I've assimilated of compassion or integrity or these things is actually like a part of my anatomy that I'm remembering. And in, in the times where the Stargate passages would, would be open, um, depending on where you're going, you actually had to have a certain quotient of these virtues cu um, cultivated within your anatomy, within your, your frequency, within your being, for you to be able to even pass through a certain stargate, right? So, um, so I find that for a lot of people, post realization this stuff happens anyways, you know, it's just, it's just natural. But for me, I'm pretty intellectual in this regard. So I, 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 it's fascinating to me, you know, to understand this stuff. And again, like, what else? what else am I going to do with my time? Right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, so. Whoa. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. I want to pull on the thread of what you said was the, the holographic disc. Is that right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a. which we could maybe also call what some spirituality calls the Akashic records. Different, different. Mm -hmm. um, the, these, these discs are actually physical plates that can be materialized. And I believe some of them are here on planet, but they're, they're nowhere to be found. You know, you're not going to find them. Um, but generally they are um, multidimensional. So the main speaker, Ashayana Dean, is now called Yesha. She was speaker one. Um, she was um, uh, the one who was the main scribe for these teachings, and um, there was two other uh, speakers originally. There's always three that'll incarnate together, um, and you know, and of course, I'm just a messenger for these teachings. Like you know, this all that stuff is for other research if you want to get deeper. But what I can speak to when it comes to the holographic this is, yeah, they can take physical form, um, but often they're in a holographic form and the speaker generally will be trained from a very young age as Ashayana was, and she'll be trained by the higher guardian councils that assist in the translation of those holographic discs. Um, but the training consists of her being able to go and actually read the discs like you would a, like a textbook. Um, but the core of these CDD plates were responsible for what we call the Maharata texts, which is the same term or very similar term to the Mahabharata texts in the Hindu tradition. Um, but the Maharada texts were the original, I think, 512 books, uh, textbooks. And those were, yeah, the original teachings of the Law of One. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so the, they basically, in many ways, they build off the higher levels of Adriana Buddhism, but they add many different layers to what that presented. Um, and um, Ashiyana is a reincarnate of a, of a fairly well-known master. I forget the name, but I mean, there's so many of them. And um, there's a couple other beings. There's quite a few beings actually in the community, and I'm I'm always hesitant in going into that too much. But uh, but yeah, so it's pretty interesting. I mean, I've been very humbled by that group of that that body of work. Um, and, and if we can get a little bit um, more clear, is the channeling or access to the holographic disc in this case? Um, this is sort of access to the, the essence of source and how it expresses itself. Essentially, yeah. And the, the channeling was more accurately, it was more, more so data streaming, as they like to call it. They're actually not advocates in the system of channeling because it can be very damaging to the template, you know, basically possession. Channeling is just a fancier term for possession, right? And I've done, a, I've done that and I had a lot of spontaneous experiences of that when I was working with psychedelics and many years ago. And I had to do a lot of healing from that, you know? So they're pretty, they're more specific on data streaming, which is different in the sense that you're streaming from uh, basically a higher version of self, you know, a higher dimensional version of yourself um, versus uh, allowing someone else to come into the body, you know, which is, yeah, can be kind of, kind of risky. I guess you could say, <laughs> especially, especially in this planet, because this planet is, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one. <laughs> I, I like the way you describe that, which is that it's so deeply just tuned into one's nature, which is already here, which is, we could say the essence of source expressing itself, or even just higher self, which is really that. 
and coming from mm-hmm. that place now. So instead of coming from the conditioning and the separation and the lack beliefs, instead coming from a place of total sourcefulness and total emptiness of self-interest and self-image and total service to creation mm-hmm. awakening, that's so deeply resonant. And it feels, it feels like having access to myself, capital S, so true, mm-hmm. like so much. Like, mm-hmm. I love that. And it, it's just like, it is like just such high alignment. Um, and just what's present there is just this indescribable freedom and this indescribable love um yeah yeah even yeah yeah, even more more words just end up you know because those like those even just the you know (laughs) the feeling and like the of of that you know we want the feeling of it you know, mm-hmm. you know, Bentinho Massaro talks about it so much. Like you want the feeling, you want the frequency or the vibration, the moment to moment experience of freedom and love, not the concept of it. Um, mm-hmm. And to like radiate that. Um, it's so, so good to radiate out just emptiness of self and emptiness of self image in pure service for creation awakening to itself. Um, ah, and like feeling it, feeling that, um, and, and that does feel like the highest when, when a dude tune in, like that's, that's really it. And, uh, the shift to that on a moment to moment experience and then surrounding ourselves, like in the triple gem Sangha, surrounding ourselves with spiritual community, surrounding ourselves with other awake expressions. So that we can get reflected when we're like, like getting a bit into lack or separation or whatever it is. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's been so important. And that's why we're building no limit society. Um, And it's such a joy um, to see how fractal like it is really. It's so Mm -hmm. so deeply fractal like, because you know, exactly where I was a year ago. um, I'm just, you know, talking to my other selves that are there now. Um, It's so deeply fractal like, and then in a year, then they'll be talking to their other selves that are where they are at now. Uh, It's, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And, And it's such an inner job, really. It's such an inner job to come from that vibration, come from that frequency from that um, purity from that emptiness of self and self-image and of that energy of stewardship shepherding service um and and just feeling the love and the freedom it's such an inner job to have that moment to moment and to basically basically be like someone is with a gun just following you around all the time ready to pull the trigger on the back of your head when you forget to come from that yeah Mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's true and then and and it's and it's like um yeah i mean in every moment you know like the simplest of moments like smiling at the stranger you know like I don't know, petting the dog, like loving the dog, making a nice meal for a friend or something, you know, just this, the simplest of moments where, um, again, if you're feeling the embodiment within like every cell of your body, essentially, you know, like then, yeah, everything can, everything is extravagant already. So like everything is redeemed, <laughs> you know, like everything is redeemed from whatever we originally thought it was, whether it's boring or mundane or this or that, you know, because I feel like if we start there, or it, it's not even we start, it's going to happen there anyways, then all like the bigger things that we think we're going to accomplish or create or manifest, it just, I mean, it becomes so much more effortless, you know? <laughs> 100%. Yeah. And how much better is it when we come from the emptiness of self and self-image and how much more better is it when we come from the purity of 
already being free, already being love with itself and creating from that whole place uh, is so good. It's because mm. then everything mm. that is created is created from a sense of the whole and from a sense of service and from love. And that's so much different than the vibration that's polluted, even, even slightly, but most of the time it's with a lot of lack of separation mm. of self-image. Um, mm-hmm. Cause then it doesn't become about the, the nothing and the everything it becomes about what can I in my body get. Mm. Um, and that's just so like you guys, you can't get more direct than this. Like mm. we just can't like, this is it. This is as direct as it's going to get. It's going to keep evolving and waking up to itself and getting more and more precise but this is really the peak of what's available right now it's basically the synthesis of all of the wisdom traditions and the Mm -hmm. distillation of them like as accurately as possible and the merging of that with science and with entrepreneurship and with shifting the mainstream into awakening like there's just nothing more precise right now and so Tune into this, like above everything else, tune into this. And then this has Sri Aurobindo and the mother Mira Alfasa call it the well of honey under the rock. Mm. And it's, it's always there. This freedom and this, and this love are always there. And the rock is separation. The rock is, is lack. Um, and the rock is the sense of lowercase s self and tying everything to that. Um, and this is it, guys. Like, this is the most direct that you can get because it's the simultaneity of there always already being the honey, but at the same time, the well of honey, but also at the same time, noticing how to dissolve the layers that have built up, which are the rock. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the brakes are off you know the brakes are off the brakes are off be mm-hmm. with every be, be everything be everything be everything yeah it's a welcoming it's an endless welcoming you know i'm constantly reminded of like when when we speak to this divine blueprint it's no different than say like the yogic divine blueprint the buddhist divine you know in like yoga you have devotion and yana and bhakti and you know uh, karma and <clears throat> Atta yoga, Kriya yoga, Tantra yoga, all these different forms, but it's like, they're all like, they're all just the fractal of the self and they all manifest in their own way at their own time, you know, and when the brakes are off, then you, you, it's like, that's, that's what's then always happening. It's like this beautiful balance. That's not like a perfect static balance. It's like, you know, like all the yogas are perfectly balanced, you know, but it's like this, it's like this beautiful wave, you know, and at, for each person and that's what's so beautiful about your podcast right is all these different individuals sharing all these different like from all these different angles of the wave or i've always i've often seen it as this like um spiral flame you know like of this fractal where we're all like we're all like dancing together through this spiral and um and that's the fractal of the whole spiritual personal development industry we can call it that or the coaching industry or the fitness industry the nutrition industry the entrepreneur like they're all these fractals of the same one flame you know where everyone is kind of just like learning knowledge passing it down learning knowledge passing it down experiencing passing it on and yeah it's uh it's a nice image to experience not just like conceptualize but to be in yes you know? To yes. participate in yes mm-hmm. ah, i love that and every time that i tune in to the essence of source and how it expresses itself and dances with itself plays with itself in this generation of universes and then these earth's orbiting stars where sentience wakes up from its illusion of separation and lack and sense of separate self that Every time when I tune into that highest sense of the essence of source, that the spiral 
as has been said in evolutionary psychology as well as the mystics, that there is this spiral dynamical play. And I love how you talk about it, like also a flame um, and also the direct experience of it above everything. Um, and you can so clearly see that because we came from a place that was feeling lack, it was feeling um, separation, and it was seeking freedom, it was seeking happiness, seeking peace, seeking love. And it shifted through these different programs or through these different stages where there was the entrepreneurial script that was running, and then there was the script of I will meditate. And then there was the script of, of I will understand what non-duality is. And then there's finally, there's just this liberation of the seeking itself, because there is a moment to moment deepest experience of what nature is. And then it's so clear because there's no more need to even run the spirituality script or the non-duality script. Um, mm. And there's no need to run the teacher script either, which is super important and heavily forgotten. Um, and then there's a, there's such an effortlessness of the freedom expressing itself like serving the spiral wherever it's at. So mm -hmm. we're, and, and that's just like, that's the bounciness and that's the freedom and the love um, and never for the amplification of self image, the proliferation of that, but it's always for other self and always for that hall of mirrors style experience that fractal like uh, dance and always for the other self, always for their awakening, which is you. Um, appearing like another self and mm -hmm. and that's i've out of everything that i've been able to call freedom it is it's really that like more than anything the simultaneity mm -hmm. of it all and then also the ability to to serve myself waking up to myself um mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. yeah there's mm -hmm. it's just it's so it's so rich it's so because that's the teach, learn, learn, teach of the one, um, yeah. which arguably is the entire intention of creation. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Just this endless sharing and endless sharing in all ways, like verbally, energetically, artistically, you know, there's so many ways to share. And I feel that like, you know, what you were mentioning before about the, balancing out like you know basic needs and everyone kind of has moved beyond these lack based the original lack you know they've, they've uprooted that original lack and then uprooting that original lack like what else is there to do but their but but creativity but like a creative flow of, of artistry and expression and connection and play and you know like that's th there isn't really much else and then you know within that there's service but the service is of very much this pure innocent creativity and i i've noticed this a lot too in this kind of paradigm of the world we're in right now where you know there's a lot of changes happening and people have all these ideas about where the world's going to head and you know splitting or these different things and but but if if you're realizing yourself as the space between everything then there isn't like this set way that the world is going to end up because of course, what's the world for one, but specifically like you're already that wherever you are. So whether you're like in some off grid community or whether you're in this, the depth of the city or, you know, you're, it's, 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 you're, you're the space in between it all. And, but, and, and with that, that's the kind of new frequency range. We could say that we're all kind of tuning to that. It's, it's like the other aspects of lack that perpetuate all the the density within around that space kind of just almost doesn't become perceivable anymore you know and and um i've noticed this a lot uh even just uh, entertaining things like gift economy energies or being nomadic kind of like you guys or you know like just like the combinations of these different ways to engage the physical world and especially the summer i was spending a lot of time just with community and in these different like community pockets people have land or out of the city in the city 
And it's just like everywhere you go, you're just met with the same frequency. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter you're, you're in the depth of the city or outside. You're just always met with the same frequency and the creative um, beauty that just emerges within all that is just endless. There's no, there's literally no end, you know? And, uh, and that's, that's, that's what I feel we're all continually acclimatizing to. And funny enough, like you were saying, the importance of community, I think it's, it's yeah so vital because so much of the spiritual journey is spent alone uh or in solitude or in the 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 inner workings and and yet it's truly within this plane of this human body the truth is we are just simply seeking intimacy you know the intimacy with self source with other or perceived other and 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 kind of dancing with that intimacy which you know we could say is creative energy or you know whatever Mm -hmm. but but I noticed that in dry fasting states too. Like, yeah, I can I can dry fast okay. a while. I was just about to head into this topic. So yeah. I love how we are both so passionate about fasting. So I'm already fasted for a day right now, which is a constant process for me, at least once every couple of weeks to at least fast for a day, sometimes up to three days. Uh, Usually water is what I'm fasting with. And then one longer fast, uh, usually every maybe six months or a year of like up to five days, water. Have not done no water yet. Mm. And the vibrancy of everything that we're talking about being embodied is amplified when we fast. Mm Mm-hmm everything we've been talking about is amplified when we fast and just most simply speaking it's because you're not your bodily energy your metabolism is not focused on the digestion of food but rather it's focused on whatever energetically the imagination the focus is dedicated to the attention is dedicated to and so that's where it's easier to be in samadhi it's easier to be in no self. It's easier to be relaxed and it's easier to not get caught by a sensation and then driven into a sense of self-image. And I feel really good about this subject together. And I feel like we may even do a, a fast together perhaps even a dry fast and then document it um, where we talk maybe on um, the first day at the end and then maybe at the end of the third day and at the end of the fifth day or something like that and tune into that experience together and podcast about it as we do it. And I feel like that could be also really instrumental as a catalyst for many of you because it can sometimes be a big Oh no, I don't know about not eating. Um, no, no, I don't know about not drinking. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And we would like to just really demystify that, um, and to make it really practical and really relatable. Um, and also at the same time to, um, mystify in terms of mysticism it for you, Mm -hmm. which is your, your feeling of God within. Um, okay. So, um, how how tell us about the history of your fasting um your cadence or your rhythm with it um what arises for you and also the segue that you were also on Mm -hmm. um yeah well yeah that's a great way of describing it i mean I, i like the flow that you have you know the balanced um approach to not doing it you know too much uh because i feel like there, there can be times where it becomes another mechanism of of we could say like bliss chasing you know i often speak to that about a lot of practices like intense breath work fasting psychedelic work they all can be kind of this chasing of a rainbow and often a chasing of higher frequency or movement into higher chakras, particularly. And um, that can be actually quite dangerous. You know, I, I remember times in my initial periods where that was like the constant focus stemming from that original lack, uh, you know, that deep, intense seeking energy that wants to like get to someplace, get to someplace. And it's almost like this, the, the image I get is almost like a, like a, a graph, like some sort of like, fractal graph that's like 
it's like shooting and then collapsing and then shooting because it's the, the foundation isn't there, you know? So it's really important that, you know, with, with people who are embarking on, well, really any practice, but particularly fasting is there is that balance and there is an approach where nothing needs to be too much of a push. I feel, I mean, it's why Buddha was always so big on the middle way and so many other teachers because they went to the extremes and they realized that didn't have anything for you there, you know? Um, and that's my approach with communicating with, with, with the, the fasting and it's still an experimentation for me, but, um, you know, this journey has been almost 10 years now where like in conjunction with my initial awakenings at 16, when I started like trying to eat better, eat like healthy chicken salads or something, some fitness diet, you know, everything in my journey of upgrades in, in terms of frequency or in terms of, um, some sort of assimilation of higher consciousness, there was a simultaneous uh, lightning in the body that was occurring, right? And and this is not just the physical aspect, but all layers of self, because um, there's a beautiful quote, and I've kind of expanded on it, but there's a beautiful quote by one of my old mentors, his name's Arnold Eret, and um, his quote was, uh, all disease is constipation. And that has stuck so much with me, and, and I view it more as physical constipation, physical toxicity, rigid mental patterns, you know, uh, stuck emotions, unprocessed shadow, unprocessed emotional energy, and energetic uh, buildup or miasmic buildup, we call it. And so all layers of that are responsible for all forms of disease and suffering, in my view, you know, like coming from that original lack, because, because we have that constipation in us, we believe there's something wrong with us. And then we go about our seeking and going about our, our running towards some, some moment, some promised land that never really gives what what we, you know, um, thought we were going to get. So each of the, you know, over the period of time where I went, you know, to vegetarian, then I went to vegan, then I went raw vegan, then I went fruitarian. And in this time starting to do, you know, small little juice cleanses or, you know, colon cleanses or different fasts and things. And, and every time starting to notice like, holy crap, like I'm doing these juice cleanses and all this stuff is coming out of me. Like, where is this coming from? You know, like this stank ass like crap you know like um really not not stuff that uh, should be anywhere in the body so that was a big eye-opener just on the physical level because I had dealt with so many physical issues in my life you know like I was a really sick kid I was always a doctor you know it was all these complications and and so you know the the process of awakening for me is just like that the, the full spectrum approach you know and the body is so vital like we, the clean the cleanliness of the temple is 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 certainly going to support us in being able to be in more of a, uh, a balanced space. And we could say maybe it's more important as a preparation for realization on some level, um, because of course, when you start to tap into that true compassion and love, you, you, you know, you can transmute a lot of things. And there's a lot of great masters in the past who didn't really give a shit about their body that much, you know? So I do understand that, that, that um, side of things, you know, like smoking cigarettes all day or eating like whatever, and because you're in such a you know peaceful space, it's almost like the frequency is kind of like dissolving a lot of these elements. But you know, some of these masters still died from, of cancer and things like this too. So for me, I'm like, well, that doesn't really feel resonant for me. Like I feel like I can take my body much farther than you know that type of approach to things, right? And so we're in a different time now, and and that's where the fasting really um, has has given me opportunity to. Um, heal you know really heal like specifically just like if we're looking at physical like all the ailments i've faced whether it's the the acne or the back issues or the, the the mental health you know brain all kinds of brain stuff and um you know everything like just so many things you know like, like i have so many lists of things that I've, I've been through and um so fasting was the doorway to that and in conjunction um and i guess the way i approach it the way i teach it is you know dry fasting yeah certainly for most is quite the stretch um, but in my view, it's like the most representative of the natural state. Um, because I always had an intuition that, you know, consumption, maybe, maybe the, 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 the chewing of the apple, the, the, maybe it's a figurative story, but in the garden of Eden, maybe that was actually way more uh, literal in regards to the fall of grace. Right. And so when we look at like Kalonic teachings, you know, they're, they're quite clear on the fact that you know many 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 years ago we were originally breatharian beings um and we were self-sustained from within us because we we had the the correct alignment within our print within our dna to be able to sustain ourselves 
but that's very much changed. And I certainly don't recommend people go breatharian or anything like that. But I, I do, not only do I see it as a possibility, but I see it as a, potentially a natural progression, maybe not in this lifetime for some, but you know, it's, it's even just small little bits of a taste of like a 36 hour dry fast where nothing is coming in, you know, not even a drop of water, not even brushing your teeth. And you're starting to now feel this, you know, you may go through a little initial, okay, the emotions start to come up or the mind starts freaking or, you know, but after a bit of practice with that, all of a sudden you start to feel this natural, like, um, like emanation, you know, like this, 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 this very subtle peacefulness. And it's like the cells, all the cells just kind of calm down, you know, like you, you start to tune into the natural compassion that's like inherently built in with you. Cause, cause when you're fast, it's like, you're naturally more gentle. You speak more gently, you know, like it's just, it's there. Right. So, so my, my flow, you know, I, I went through many phases. I, I was really into the fruitarian thing for a while, where I was going on extended fruit diets. And that was a big change because in my experience, even if someone doesn't get in any fasting, if the whole world changed to about 60 to 70 percent high water, uh, high water containing fruits and vegetables, in, in primarily raw form, uh, I, I view like a good portion of the disease in the planet would be eradicated, you know, just from that simple shift alone. Um, and that's generally where I start with people. I'm just like, literally just start with that. 60% of your diet, high, high uh, water foods, you know, like then eat whatever else you want. You want to eat meat, you want to do that, like do whatever you want. But if, if you just start to open up that and you start to hydrate in a new way, um, that can be a huge step, right? Um, and then I got into juice fast. I did a 39 and a half day juice fast. I did many 10 days, you know, I did uh, all kinds of little fasts in between. The juice just fast to make sure great. everybody, just to make sure everybody heard you clearly, um, 39 and a half day, 39.5 day juice fast. Yeah, yeah. And that one, that one was so effortless actually because I had prepped for so long. I was, I was already, you know, in a natural kind of fruitarian type of what space. Um, I guess I don't really label myself as any form of eating, but if there was one that feels most resonant, it's called, um, it comes from the Essene tradition, the esoteric teachings of Jesus. Um, and it's called a uh, compassionate fruitarianism, which is essentially it's fruitarianism, but it extends into nuts, seeds, sprouted grains, and also even animal products, because it's just like a raw milk, raw, raw goat milk, raw, raw cheese, because all of these things are just provided for without you needing to kill an animal or even a plant, right? Because you can still like kill a, kill a carrot and, you know, they actually have faces sometimes you can tune into that. So the compassionate fruitarianism was this model that was, that was, you know, essentially one of the core approaches in that time that was not, you're not killing anything, but it was, it's beyond what we typically view as fruitarianism, you know, which is just like fruit, I guess. But that's, that's probably most accurate, but I don't exclusively stay there. You know, I, when I went on that juice cleanse, I cleared out so much plaque. So plaque is like a buildup of old fecal matter that could be in there for 10, 20, 30 years, right? Whatever age. Um, so that's like a tar that starts to come out of you. So I had multiple feet of that coming out of me over that, that period of time mixed with all kinds of other things and so it was a big eye-opener because you know I don't know like if you just leave food in your fridge for a month you know what I mean uh we usually have to take it out after a month now think about your your body being a 38 degree sauna <laughs> where you have old food in your body and it's been there for 20 years like if the idea that people you know were so confused as to the origin of all these diseases we have all these separate diagnosis and specialists for the left toe and the right finger and this and that and like but really it's all coming from the same main core and that's a lot of it meaning we haven't eliminated properly the stuff we've consumed because we've been so addicted to consumption in all forms right and i i view that primarily being the connection of food and emotion or food and love because the moment we come out of the womb my old uh breath, this old pranic breatharian teacher taught me this she was speaking about the idea of her name's Svetlana, and she was speaking about how the moment you come out of the womb, what do you get? You get the breast. Any any noise you're making, you get the breast. When you're a good boy or a good girl, you get you get the breast. You get the food. You know, when you're bad, maybe you get a not so tasty food. You know, every emotion essentially is tied to the, the consumption of food, right? Uh, social gatherings, you know, family gatherings, and all of it. So. So it's a beautiful thing. And I love eating with people. And I love, you know, when I'm eating, I absolutely love eating. I'm like, I just adore it. I've been more, I've become more of a foodie 
since I've been in this, yeah. right? Yeah. But when I'm fasting, I absolutely, I love the fasting. And I think that's the biggest, most important principle to remember is it's not about just becoming a breatharian or, you know, you know, shunning food. It's just back to that divine love, that devotional yes. energy. Exactly. Right? Hardcore remembering moment to moment. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, that's it. I, I feel like um, it's one of the most accessible, also mainstream uh, gateways uh, mm. to waking up um, is fasting along with the breath and self-inquiry. Um, but fasting is like a simple way to just say it would be like, bitch, you think you, you think you can, you think you're going to die from not eating for a day? You, you, you think, you think that You think that you're going <laughs> to go an entire 80 year life without spending one day completely fasted? Mm. Like, are you bitch? Like, you can't do that? <laughs> like, really? Or you can't go two days without eating? You think you're going to die? Mm. Like, <clears throat> so um, I felt a similar energy six years ago when I did my first 10 day Vipassana meditation retreat, like a lot of the energy was just like, I can sit down for 10 straight days and shut the fuck up. I don't have to talk for 10 straight days. I would love to see what happens when I shut up for 10 straight days and what happens. Like I would love to, the same thing's true with fasting, you know, mm -hmm. just be excited or exhilarated or thrilled by what will happen when you, uh, break your chain of addiction to eating for a day. Um, yeah. And so that's one of my favorite approaches to it. And I see it as a huge gateway for, for mainstream waking up. And then also another thing that you said that I think is just so potent and so scientifically on point, because for the longest time we've been talking about now the gut, the gastrointestinal tract, having so much being like a second brain, Mm -hmm. And there's so much age, also billion year intelligence that's located there. Because we're talking about all of these uh, bacteria and so many other parts to the uh, biological kingdoms that are billions of years old that we're in a symbiotic relationship with that are housed here in our, on our gut. And this, as you describe in this 40 day juice cleanse, that to me, it appears like where in the GI tract, you're going to have, especially like in the, in the small intestine, you're going to have a, you, you have these villi. And they're, they're basically these nutrient absorbers that line the gut like this. And there's tons and tons and tons of them. And so as, as, the, as the food moves through after it's already been um, significantly broken down by the stomach acid, um, that there's an absorption that happens by these villi into your, into your body. And I feel like what you're talking about is that over time, especially with zero cleanses, that there's a, a sludginess that builds up in those, in those villi, like in these pockets and around them and what the water or the juice cleanses do is that they provide a um, desludgification, whereas the hard food, they uh, further and further add and add. And yeah, some of it can slide out, but then more of it gets stuck and some of it slides out more of it. And then there's some that's stuck from five years ago or 10 years ago that's just been built up. Um, is that also how you see it? Also from that scientific um, side of the coin. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great way of describing it. You know, there's a, 
sometimes as well too like the intestinal tract like you know it's like a tube and then sometimes that stuff builds up and actually creates like a secondary pocket right where because that's a lot of like doctors you know they put cameras up there and they're like oh well there's no plaque where is it i'm like think about it you know these the gi tracks almost 30 feet long it's like a two-story house of course there's going to be stuff all in there in all the different crevices right and so yeah that's a really good way of um describing it and you know so we have you know mucoid plaque you have what's called a biofilm which is like yeah sludgy like film mucousy type membrane that starts to come out um acids parasites worms there's all kinds of worms and shit i've seen come out of people myself sometimes you even sneeze it out it's coming out of your brain because the gi tract is the first avenue right including of the liver and then kind of like the kidneys but then you also have the lymphatic system and in the western medical system the the, the obsession is with blood Blood, 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 right? And that's why they can never find and have so, so, so much difficulty diagnosing people a lot of times because the blood is not generally the issue. The, the over acidity in the lymphatic system, which is the other liquid system, which is the elimination channels of our body, that's what's blocked up. And that's blocked up through the kidneys, blocked up through the GI tract. Our skin is heavily like, in, like kind of just clogged, right? So, that's really the core of where we're, we're going to find the, the, the original issue. It's like if you didn't flush your toilet for 20 years, I mean, it's, your whole house would get destroyed, you know? So, um, so you know, the juice fast and, the, and sometimes the water fast, that helps a lot with clearing out the colon. And it's really important. And my programs, at least, that I, that I put out, like, they, they focus on that because that's for most people, that's, you have to start there, you know? Um, because if you start detoxing everything else, then you start retoxifying yourself you know, because you're, everything's blocked up, including your GI tract. So it all starts to, right. So that's the first step before you get into dry fasting, but dry fasting is like exponentially um, more of an efficient healer because in dry fasting, you basically turn your body into an internal inferno, right? Your body starts going through its glycogen stores first. And then once it gets through glycogen stores, it goes into autophagy. And that's where the lysosomes in your cells, which are like the furnaces, they start eating all the dead, sick, or the unhealthy, sick, cancerous, and the fat cells. And they start breaking them down, um, removing that waste, and then rehydrating yourself with that living water that's within those cells. So it's funny enough, you actually don't feel that dehydrated. Oh my dehydrated. gosh, that's how the functionality works. So autophagy, as diseased cells are destroyed, the body will then nourish itself with the water from the diseased cells. That's yep. so interesting. I was always wondering how the body would have like a hydrative component um, during yep. that time because the burning of glucose for energy and then burning of uh, fat for energy is so common. People recognize ketosis when they drop into that. Um, but in terms of maintaining a stable sense of being hydrated and not thirsty for even a period of, um, what do, what it's, uh, the, 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 the mantra that we've been programmed with is uh, three minutes without air, three days without water, three weeks without food. It's a mantra. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, well, it's, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's and it's it's become a um, like Aubrey de Grey, who we've had on the show several times, talks about aging like a trance, like it's a pro aging trance, like that it's totally normal to get cancer and die, um, and that we should just be totally normalize that. But that's just a trance that we've tranced ourselves with, rather than feeling into well, actually, bitch, I'm gonna live until I'm 120 or 150. Um, and the way that I'm going to do that is by mm. tuning, is by tuning into, um, the way that cells become diseased and eradicating, um, any diseased components within cells as they arise. Um, and, um, yeah. one, one of the greatest ways to do that through all of the natural paths that we've studied is through fasting. It's so good. So, okay. So, um, keep hitting us with where you were at on the, how the body, uh, continues hydrating itself. So, so interesting during water fat, during water fasting. Yeah. Well, the, the dry, um, yeah. So the, the dry, dry fasting. Fast. Yeah. It's called yeah. dry fasting. Yep. 
Okay. Yeah. No, no food, no water. And, um, you know, I've, I've learned from individuals that are more breatharian based. So they're not even using the term fasting. They just, they just say living in the natural state or the pranic state, right. Where mm -hmm. they're, they're focused on, um, how to just continue it as a lifestyle, which I think, you know, for 99% of people, it's not going to be, so that's totally fine. But even just a, you know, extended dry when, when there's a preparation for it, that, that literally could be like, years worth of healing you know I'm, I'm actually starting to create like a calculation of comparison between dry to water to fruit to juice it's kind of difficult to do but it, it's 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 a bit exponential so what i understand is like a seven day dry could equal to amount 40 days water maybe 50 days juice 60 days juice you know 12 day dry that's going to be like some like 67 days water 100 120 days juice you know so like it's like ex exponential the speed what and the... yeah it's crazy okay so for every day of let's say uh dry fasting is let's say um maybe correct me if i'm wrong maybe two <laughs> two or three days of water fasting which one day of dry fasting is equivalent to maybe four or five days of juice fasting something along those lines i'd say a bit more even like five to six days five to seven days water and then you know eight to nine maybe of juice i'm still kind of feeling into this one I have to one do day of dry yeah yeah is equivalent to almost a week of of water fasting or juice fasting I think it, it'll be more prevalent once you get over the uh, autophagy threshold, right? Because around 36, 48 hours, sometimes three days it may take. Yeah. So when you're speaking under three days, the effects are going to be beautiful, ah, but, mm -hmm. but not like, yeah, my, you know, they're interesting. So you really you know, have to, you really have to get over the autophagy threshold, especially in the dry fast to really begin seeing what you're talking about. So once you get over three days or so of dry fasting, then you'll feel these like compounding benefits that will feel like you've been juice fasting for two weeks or something. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's how I've experienced it. I mean, like on this last protocol that I did, I didn't make it the whole way, but it's, it's essentially 11 days. So I did about 10. And, um, you know, uh, that comes from a doctor named Dr. Filanov, uh, Sergei Filanov from Russia. They're big on the dry fasting and pranic living and stuff. So he has a clinic where he runs people through this 11, 12 day protocol. And he's kind of got it down to like a, a real specific science. And, um, you know, they've had the most remarkable healings happen from everything you could pretty much think of. And there's basically two main acid crises or releases that happen. The first one is from day around four to six. And the second one is from eight to 10 ish. And I experienced both of those and they're quite something. I mean, I, I was pretty prepared, but even still, you know, and you know, so, so you can really, cause, cause the, the vision I had with the dry is just this idea that almost it's like all the sludge from every crevice of your body, you know, like your joints, your muscles, your brain, like that's what's being pulled out. It's not just the GI tract anymore. And, and that's basically what I felt like I experienced because, you know, I'm, I'm about four days after the breaking, I'm still on liquids and man, I'm still purging all kinds of stuff. And it's not so much solid without getting too much detail, but just acid waste. That's the, the best way I could describe it, you know? And for me, I feel like that's just coming from everywhere, like every crevice of my body where that has potentially been stored. I don't, I don't know really, you know, I'm still uncovering it. Um, so I still feel like a baby in it all, but, um, but yeah, so, you know, the dry, it's no joke. I mean, it, it, but it's definitely, it's very efficient and and, you know, if people, you know, even for me, I used to go just doing intermittent, that intermittent dry fasting was the biggest, one of the biggest noticeable shifts on my path with when it comes to this type of healing, right? Like, you know, we dry fast every night. People say they don't dry fast, you dry fast every night. That's what sleeping is. It's dry fasting. So if you just extend that, you know, 12 to 20 hours daily intermittent dry fasting, and then the, you have you have that open window of four to twelve hours of eating. You know, for me it was like a lot of fruits and quinoas and some cooked veggies or something. Different phases, right? That in itself could just be a, a huge step, you know. And then 
you get used to that. Maybe that's a year for you. Maybe that's a while. And then, then you maybe do like a 36 hour or 20, you know, a 48 hour or something like this. And you keep kind of building up. And that's how, that's how I view it now. Like it's better to just keep building over time. There's no, unless you're in a real chronic state, right. Where there's a real serious situation and we won't get into that too much, but I mean, that's, that's generally where you don't really have much time to waste, you know? Um, but it, it, it doesn't have to be dry. You know, you could do other forms and things that are a bit more of a easeful, graceful, you know, step, I guess. So, yeah. <laughs> I love how you described it like a pulling out of all sludge and yeah. of, all, of all toxicity. That was great. And then another point that I wanted to share with, especially mainstream is that leveraging this as a gateway is also very powerful for you saving a fuckload of time, which is also <laughs> fascinating. Um, you have no idea how many hours um, you spend on uh, the acquiring of food, um, the eating of food, um, the cleaning up of food, um, the money that's spent on food, um, and the energy fluctuation also is huge. So, um, imagine like you're in a, you're in a work sprint on something from nine until noon. And then at noon to one, you go and you get lunch, but it's never just, you know, spending 20 bucks and getting food and then eating it. Um, but it's also, the fact that then that food creates a spike in your glucose and then you have a your body your metabolism it has to forcibly um, generate insulin to be able to deliver that glucose to it the cells so you're forcing your body into metabolic processes to deal with your spike of glucose and that's why people feel what's called that like afternoon siesta, um, mm -hmm. you know, and um, what a great way to um, train oneself, but then to not have a one to two to three o'clock, like murpiness to your energy, but rather from 12 to one to two to three, all of that time, you're still rolling, you're still fueled, whether you're mm -hmm. out whether you're out in nature or you're in a workflow or you're reading a book or you're talking to a friend or you're jumping between different meetings or whatever it is, like there's so much power in the amount of time and energy that's saved um, also um, and where we can reallocate that. And uh, I feel like that's another really crucial point for mainstream. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, and also the element that because the most, most, most individuals idea is that, well, you know, my energy comes from food and liquids, right? But if we really break that down, food and liquid is only one avenue to where we, we sustain our energy, right? Like what happens when you're inside for too long, and then you go outside and you get in the sun, and you feel like the exuberance and the energy that fuels you up from the sun, you know, or you go, you go on a run or a walk or you work out and you're moving the breath, or you're doing some breath work, again, all this energy from the breath bare feet on the soil, you know, rolling around in the grass, like being in, in the green, once again, more energy, um, you know, intimate connections, like social connections, like creative movement. If you're in like a, a truly creative, like pure, like uh, communication, you'll feel energized after not drained, you know? So there's so many more ways that we, we are fueled by energy, like let alone just the source of God itself, like just the, the nature of, of who we actually are is perpetuating like the sun, you know, like it's just like this sun like radiance from within. So when you, when you go into a dry or something like this, you may have to go through these initial layers of purification and withdrawal and low energy. And so there's a trusting in the body that happens there, you know, sleep when you're tired, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but in truth, you start to really see actually how much energy you have you know, like I, in the summer, I was dry passing all the time. I was still doing 30K bike rides. I was driving all around, you know, connecting with people and the energy is just there, 
Um, and then when I want to eat, I want to eat and then I eat and it, and, it's, and it doesn't have to be any sort of dogmatic approach with it. Um, and also, like, I'll reiterate the importance of the emotional work, the, the I, you know, I call it shadow work or trauma work, because, again, the, the bliss chasing is what is generally caused by a lack of integration of shadow, in my view. You know, it's like a it's like a running to somewhere without integrating the, you know, the darkest, shittiest, whatever aspects of you that you have to take a look at. Um, and I feel like those two in particular in conjunction is really what brings a true sense of grounding. Because I don't, I don't define grounding as feeling dense. I feel I, I view grounding as an embodiment of our, you know, fullest self yeah. in this present moment awareness. You know, totally. Um, and so, so because people bring that up a lot, like, oh, you know, you're gonna feel lofty, and and I, yeah, I went through a lot of phases where I was fasting. I felt very lofty in that, but nowadays, I mean, I feel more grounded than ever, and you know, it's because it's, we've talked about so many topics today. And I feel like that's the point. It's like, it's not just one thing, you know, it's, it's, it's this full spectrum approach. And we'll, we'll always be kind of like brought back into balance if we go too far in one direction or get attached to one idea or something, you know? So, yeah. And another important scientific way to understand it is that there's a higher ATP or adenosine triphosphate density in fat than there is in glucose. So you're mm -hmm. feeling more energy. So in the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle, you're actually feeling more energy when you're burning fat than you are when you're burning glucose. Glucose is a horrible source of energy in comparison to fat. Fat is an incredible, powerful, uh, longer burning, much more cleaner burning um, source of energy. And this is exactly what people talk about when they eat uh, avocado or whatever, rather than um, like eating a, a greasy burger or whatever it is. Um, that you can feel, why can you feel a difference between when you eat an avocado and how much, like how like light, like that feels and how like slow burning and like nice that feels for like even four hours, you can get by on an avocado, um, versus when you eat that at that burger and that bread, like you're, you're just like, bleh, and like, it just mm. feels so draining on your energy levels. Um, and so and it's, it's another really good thing to tune into ketosis and to tune into um, what will happen when I get over the, um, the ghrelin, which is the, the hormone that's secreted for hunger. Um, when I get over those little ghrelin spikes that I've been conditioned and trained to be secreted every however many four to six hours, when I get over those little ghrelin um, secretions, then what happens is I'm in ketosis and I, I feel more and more of that steady, higher energy burn in that um, less and less of the immediacy of needing to respond to just the, the ghrelin and oh, um, mm. and then there's another thing, which is the sovereignty. There's so much sovereignty and so much will and so much choice um, that's that's unfrozen from conditioning and from patterns and is able to sort of like take its divine creatorhood more precisely. Um, and you can just drive your attention and your focus, your imagination, your creativity, will to whatever so much more frictionlessly. Um, and yeah, so all of those things together are, you know, just a, a little bit, I'm so happy that we talked about it on on the show, but this is even just like it's concept still for many of you that haven't went a day without eating, um, mm -hmm. get the direct experience of it more than anything is go one day without eating. Are you a little bitch or can you do it? Cause <laughs> you can do it. I know you can. And I'm talking to, I'm talking to myself right now because this is exactly the same energy that, you know, a couple of years ago was my, my feeling of like, ah, oh, I, I, I can do it. I can, I can do that. Um, and so I know that there are yeah. other selves that are feeling that same way. Um, and so overcome any limiting beliefs you have and 
be able to get the direct experience of what we're talking about and what it feels like. And then it's like a muscle and you want to train it. And so who knows, maybe Corey and I will do a, a dry fast even together and do some podcasts about it. So um, it'd be super cool, bro. Yeah. 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 That would be cool. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's a pretty remarkable. And like you said, it's such an easy practice for people to access, you know, it's not, yeah, it's like 24 hours, three days, you know, it's not really the end of the world, but it can't. It, and I think that's what we, we uproot, like how crazy the mind is, you know, like, yes. like, you know, it, it's just, it's just a funny thing, but, um, but yeah, that'd be really cool. That'd be really cool. Yeah, bro. Mind is always craving, always craving. And like, uh, we get great insight into that craving process also from, um, slowing down and fasting. Cause, um, I remember one time I didn't eat refined sugar for like almost a whole year. Um, It was while I was dating one of my uh, ex-girlfriends for almost three years. And I remember her, her anger, because she was like, why don't you eat desserts with me? And then I remember like being in an elevator with someone that was bringing freshly baked cookies to some sort of event that we were hosting and I had never smelled refined sugar before up until that point. Like, I just remember when only from fasting from refined sugar from such a long time, did I realize like the addictive cravingness, um, like the true addictive cravingness to it. Um, mm. And then it's, and then, you know, you collapse the duality as well and you enjoy some cookies and a brownie <laughs> and, uh, and whatever the fuck you want too. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Exactly, man. I mean, I remember I had this uh event. We did a convention or something at, in Montreal and uh we were, I was basically dry fasted the whole weekend and um I had coconut water that that evening, but other than that, you know, we were doing 12 hour days and just, you know, all out, very social. And then at the end, I wanted to treat the whole team to a meal and we went to this vegan spot and they have this amazing like, you know, Indian, it's like an Indian family that runs it and man like I had never eaten something with such like, I was crying in the meal. Like I, I, I was eating as, it was like, everything was alive, you know, like every rice was alive. Like it was like speaking to me. It was, <laughs> I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. And it was just a perfect example of, you know, like just when you're in, when there's a natural like fluidity with the experience of whether you're eating, whether you're fasting, whether you're doing this and not the dogmas of things, then it's God. It's it's it. <laughs> yeah. No. I would love to hear from you guys also about if you would enjoy or like to see us do a dry fast together and document it and how often you would like to see us do the episodes. Um, Right now we're feeling like maybe at the end of day one, at the end of day three, at the end of day five, so a rhythm like that. So let us know what you feel. Um, And also um, I'm feeling really good even about rapping now. I feel like we've covered so much, bro. Do you feel good? You feel content, like complete? Yeah, cool. Yeah, this has been great, man. It's been really great. I mean, it was just, yeah, spontaneity, you know, just let it flow. And uh, yeah, it's beautiful. I really appreciate you and this platform you've developed and and everyone watching, you know, it's nice. Yeah, bro. Mm-hmm. I, I appreciate you tremendously. I appreciate our brotherhood a lot. I feel a lot of power together. Um, I feel like this is only the, I'm noticing less and less people come on the show and because I'm obviously self-selecting and that the quality of the people that are coming on the show is so much higher now in terms of resonance with the Mm -hmm. nature um, and with brotherhood, like long-term creating potential. And it feels so good that that's the case. Um, And so I feel like we could even not only do um, that cool dry podcast, dry podcasting (laughs) oh my god dry fasting podcasting um but i also feel like we can even just like revisit every 
like three months or whatever into conversation together and just see where each other are, keep, uh, keep it rolling powerfully. And um, yeah, and also, so where is it best for um, people to follow, besides Instagram, Instagram, um, Corey's prolific on there, posting all the time, writing great posts, um, sharing great content on there. Where else would be another good place for people? And we'll link all this in the bio. Um, yeah, well, I have a, a YouTube channel I'm, st- I'm getting a bit more active on, but uh, also my website, a- AYP, Awaken Your Potential or AYP.life. Um, so yeah, we can link that. And um, but yeah, Instagram is a great place too. So yeah, those are the places. Sweet. So Instagram, YouTube, and AYP.life. And yeah. those links will be in the bio below. Um, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We love you infinitely. This was a dope episode. We hope you guys got a lot of value. A lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's funny. I'm looking at the camera, and I'm, like, seeing my other selves watching right now. And it's, like, so fucking trippy. And there's no substances involved except just natural state of existence. Um, I love you. <laughs> I love me. Uh, I love I um and thank you thank you for tuning in um like the video it helps the algorithm also comment below with your thoughts on the episode um subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet and share the video also if it resonates with other people that you feel like it would make a profound impact on and check out the links in the bio to all things Corey shake and that's all fam love you guys so much thanks for tuning in i'll end the recording and then you and i will stay in the room together okay sure. bye everyone <laughs>